If you ache for truth, goodness, and beauty, if you're hungry for a Christianity with substance and strength, if you long for a faith that's big and bold and biblical and all about Jesus Christ, if you're inspired by the idea of one church that has spanned 20 centuries, 24 time zones, and two hemispheres, enfolding every race, nation, and language, then you're considering Catholicism. Welcome back to the podcast. I am Greg, your host, and I am here with Corey. Hello again. Corey and I are going to talk about a hot topic. It's always kind of a hot topic, but it's a particularly hot topic at the time that we're recording this near the end of August because we are in the United States. Not all of you are in the United States, but we in the United States are heading into a presidential election and there's politics and it's a big deal. And so an issue has arisen at the time we're recording this in the last couple of days concerning IVF, which is in vitro fertilization. And the issue is that through the way that the politics are playing out, none of the major candidates in our presidential election are going to commit to any kind of a ban on IVF. I'm not commenting on anybody. I'm just saying that none of the major candidates in this election have committed to or have all expressed that if elected, they would not do anything to legally, uh, what, you know, have any kind of a federal limit or, yeah. Yeah. From a federal standpoint, they would not ban it or limit it and they would not stand in the way of insurance companies and whatnot funding IVF. Okay. So that has been basically taken off the table of all of the major candidates. And so this has a lot of Catholic commentators expressing a lot of frustration that they want at least one major candidate or major political party or something to give them the option to vote for somebody who will stop or try to stop or limit or whatever IVF. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm choosing my words very carefully here because Corey and I talked about this in advance. And so this has, as I told him this morning when I told him I wanted to talk about this, this has uh, Catholic Twitter big mad. Everybody on Catholic Twitter is like outrageously outraged that there is no major political party in the United States or major candidate of a political party that's going to do anything to stop IVF or try to stop IVF. Okay? Right? Is that fair? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, I do not want this episode to be about politics. It will not be about politics. It's kind of interesting. I've known Corey 12, 14 years, something like that. A while. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's got to be like something like that. Mm -hmm. And in a dozen or more years that I've known you, I don't think we've ever talked about politics. Well, it depends on what fits into that category. There's been plenty of subjects that are political in nature. Subjects, but, but we've yeah, never just, really, that's never really. Like hashing a, out candidates or something, no. Yeah, it's never really been a big part of the conversations we've had over the years, which is weird because I have a lot of <laughs> conversations about politics with some people in my life, and mm -hmm. you're just not one of them. So I different don't know. strokes for different folks. Different know what that means, but we had a good relationship. But we've Maybe kinda, that's why. Maybe, maybe that's why, because <laughs> we've stayed away from this. I Maybe I just intuit that this is not something that we want to get into. So I, I, when I told Corey I wanted to talk about this, he looked like he was going to vomit. And he had this look on his face. I've known him long enough to know when he looks like he's going to vomit, you know, like looks kind of sick and green in the gills. And I, it was like, oh, no, 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 we're not going to get into politics. So I think he's worried about going on having, you know, his voice electronically recorded and distributed to the world, opining on, on politicians and political parties. So, so here's the deal. We're not, we're going to talk about IVF in this episode, but we're not going to talk about the politics because here's my contention. And this is why I told Corey, well, well, let's lay this out. All right. Mm -hmm. Let's stipulate. That's what you do. You yes. Know, in logical things. Good distinctions. You know, you, you, well, you stipulate at the beginning, which mm -hmm. means like from legally, a legal standpoint or an argument, you, you lay it down. Like we mm -hmm. all agree. Okay. So let's stipulate point number one. IVF is contrary to all Catholic teaching 
on morals and the human person. That's correct. In fact, let's stipulate that IVF is, in the teaching of the Catholic Church, an objective grave moral evil. Yep, that okay. is true. So we all agree on that. And therefore, we should want to limit or prevent an objective grave moral evil from taking place. Is that yep. fair to say? All right. So the issue is, well, what are we supposed to do as Catholics in the United States? Mm-hmm. Okay. My contention to Corey this morning, and, and then I kind of talked him back from the ledge because he looked like he was going to run out of my office because he didn't want to talk about this. So I said, look, my, what I want to do in this episode is say that at this time in August 2024, not a currently viable pathway or option for us to stop IVF through political means in the United States. So if we want IVF to stop or be limited, we have to pursue that by other means. Is that fair, Corey? Yeah. What, what I said to you when we talked about this before is because I don't want, I really just don't want to talk about what someone should or shouldn't do or, it, or want to do about this politically is to say that there may be political things that should be done. That's a separate conversation. And I'm even willing to say that it's necessary that something be done politically or legislatively. But even if it's necessary, it's not sufficient, that, that it's not enough to right. handle it through those channels, that what we want to talk about is at the level of evangelization and interpersonal okay. relationships and culture, right? and how important that is. Well said. Every, like, here, let me, what I told Corey earlier was that each one of us going into this election has a, not only the right, but the responsibility to with a well-formed conscience, make our own political calculus, Mm -hmm. right? You've got to weigh the issues and the candidates and the options and the, you know, the ideal world and the real world. And you have to throw all of that into this, you know, jumble thing out and decide what you're going to do. Okay. We're not here to tell you that. What I'm trying to tell you, say is that if you want to stop or limit IVF, we have to deal with the problem or the challenge that people want to do it. Mm-hmm. And, okay. that's the, and that's the case with any number of things, where there may well be some political action that we need to take, but that's not enough. Right. And if we want to, I hate to use the word combat, but if we want to fight against the proliferation of IVF, we have to deal with it at three levels other than the political. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying we can't do it politically, but we have to deal with it from the level of apologetics, evangelization, and pastoral care. And here's why. I don't believe that most Americans, number one, understand why the Catholic Church opposes it. I think that's true. They don't. I don't think a lot of Catholics understand why. Mm -hmm. I would say at least 50% of nominal Catholics in the United States have no idea why the Church opposes it. I would say that most Protestants and evangelicals have no clue why the church opposes it, or that isn't makes sense to them. And obviously, secular people don't understand why. So if you throw all that into a basket, I'd say 80% of the American public doesn't understand the Catholic position. That requires teaching and apologetics and catechesis. Right. Okay. Secondly, even if we do the teaching and apologetics, it's not necessarily an an easy thing to understand unless it's in the broader context of Catholic philosophical and moral teaching about the nature of the human person, about the nature of sexuality, and about, you know, you know moral teachings and whatever. Mm-hmm. It is something that's nestled in. Like, you can say to somebody, hey, it's wrong to hit your neighbor in the head with a two-by-four. And most people go, I understand that. That makes sense. Yeah. Right? If your neighbor has a pet turtle— and you steal your neighbor's pet turtle and torture the pet turtle, most people get, I get why that's wrong. When you say couples struggling with fertility, married couples struggling with fertility, seeking a way to have a baby, the Catholic Church opposes them using IVF. They're like, I don't, even when you explain why, that only sort of, I want to say, makes sense against the backdrop of, the larger backdrop of Catholic Right. It's, down, it's downstream from other moral issues, which doesn't mean that it's less important in some way. It just means that if you don't understand and accept this and this, then you don't get to the conclusion IVF is wrong. Right. 
downstream or built upon sure. other not only moral but philosophical premises. Yes, there are foundations under it that you have to understand. You, yeah, you have to sort of buy all of that. Okay, so what that means is that until people have fully formed Catholic consciences, they're not really going to get it. So if we're going to, I, I'm going to scare quotes, fight against IVF or Fred mm-hmm. Limited, we're going to have to do better apologetics. We're going to have to do evangelization and help people really embrace the faith and form, fully form understandings and consciences. Mm-hmm. And then the third thing is we're going to have to deal pastorally with this. And, you know, here's the thing. I, I said to Kurt, Corey earlier, when you look at some things that we consider morally wrong, like, you know, don't go out and steal your neighbor, neighbor's pet turtle, you know, or, you know, whatever. Don't hit your neighbor in the head with a two by four. Or even things like, you know, don't go out and sell heroin to children or don't, you know, or whatever. I mean, there's a lot of things you can say, well, when the people are doing that, they're pursuing an inherently bad thing, mm-hmm. right? These are people who are doing a bad thing and know they're doing a bad thing or should know they're doing a bad thing. But when you're dealing with couples that are pursuing IVF, almost exclusively, I would say exclusively, you're dealing with people who have tried every other fertility treatment. Okay, first of all, you're dealing with married people because two like, you know, young single people who don't have a commitment are not, you know, maybe they're civilly married or something, but, you know, you're not like people just don't casually do this. It's generally couples who have exhausted all of other kinds of fertility treatments. Or at least all that they're aware of, yeah. Yeah, well, that the doctors have advised them on mm-hmm. because IVF is extremely expensive. It's like the most expensive thing they can do. So they've probably tried all the normal things, right? Mm-hmm. And they've kind of come to the end of their option. And as we'll get into this in a minute, maybe, you know, they've looked into adoption and there's a number of reasons why adoption is becoming not viable for many people in the United States because it's a extremely expensive there's a lot of things that have been going on politically in our country that have made adoption way more difficult than it was 20 years ago or 40 years ago. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Now, young you know, couples that want to adopt a healthy young baby, it's extremely expensive, extremely time consuming, and the probability of you have, of, of getting a healthy young baby is extremely low. And so you have these couples that are like, I, we're, what we want to do seems like a good thing. We want to have a baby. Isn't, doesn't the church believe in life and families? And we go to church and we see families around us with all these children. Like we see Corey and his whole pew full of kids sitting over there. And, you know, like we're in pain and we're crying and we're sorrowful. And, you know, we're just trying to do the best to have a baby so that we can raise a baby in the church. And this teaching that the church has that we what we that pursuing this would be a grave moral evil is, is painful to us. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, it's a hard teaching. And so if you're just going to tell people, no, you can't do that, you better have some pastoral care to help them figure out how to bear that cross in their life. Right. Yeah. Makes sense? So here's what we're going to do. We're not going to talk, tell you how to vote. You do need to figure out how to vote. That is a responsibility you have as a citizen to figure out what you're going to do, whether you're going to vote, not vote, who to vote for, whatever. But what we're going to talk about is what we need to do as Catholics to fight this fight within the culture and within the lives of people. Okay. Yes. So, wow, this is a really long wind up. So let's do these really quick because I think we can do them relatively quick. So let's start with the apologetics. Corey, what are the most common three reasons given why the Catholic Church calls this an objective grave moral evil? Yeah. So this is in quick form because obviously there's more that could be said about any of these, but the big one that, that you're going to hear about, and that is a big deal, is the fact that when embryos are are produced or created whatever verb you want to use using the IVF process there's more of them created than are ever going to be born or implanted in a woman's womb and a lot of them are going to be killed there's going to be abortion that takes place after these embryos are Dis- produced discarded would be the scientific term sure th- that they but the point is that Right. Essentially, they are abortions. Right. It's a human being in very early stages of development that's going to be killed and thrown away. So that's kind of the biggest one. The second is kind of related is that because there are so many more embryos created than will ever be implanted or, or brought to full term, a great many embryos are frozen 
that are created through IVF are, are frozen and stored, and there's really no end game for them. Uh, it's so that if the couple might want to do this again, they kind of have embryos in reserve. And so not only do you have human beings in a very early stage of development that are just Im- imprisoned in this very inhumane way, you're treating them as stock or as extra or as something that can be, you know, either brought into being or taken out of being at will by, yeah. by you and by the doctor. It's an affront to human dignity mm-hmm. because as you say, I like your term stock, that you have an inventory of spare human beings. It's a reduction of the human being to a utilitarian you know, notion. It, it, it's basically treating the human body and the human person as a thing and having an inventory of persons for your use. And so it's an affront to human dignity. Yeah. I mean, this is how embryos who would have some kind of disability or even just some kind of trait that the parents don't want, that it's a girl when they want a boy or, you know, the embryo doesn't appear to have the qualities that would make them, you know, intelligent or have blue eyes or whatever the parent wants would be discarded for that reason. The third reason has to do with the teaching about marriage and sexuality. You're essentially breaking the sexual nature of the couple that's participating in this. So the way that that God has designed things is that, you know, human beings would be conceived and born in the context of a sexual relationship between a man and a woman. Obviously, we hope for that to be within marriage and then, and then born that way. The Catholic way of articulating this is that one of the primary purposes or the two primary purposes of marriage would be unitive, so bringing the spouses together, and procreative of producing offspring, and that these things can't be separated or divorced from each other without violating God's intention for, for, this, uh, for this institution, for how human beings naturally propagate. And so if what we're doing is we're taking human gametes and we're artificially creating an embryo in a glass test tube um, and then implanting it into a a woman's womb, we've sort of hijacked God's process. um, And that has negative consequences for the marriage, the relationship between the husband and wife. And it's just a a violation against the rights of the child as well to be conceived and brought up in that, that plan that God had for this. Okay, clearly stated, the Catholic Church opposes IVF for the three reasons you've given. Number one, it inevitably results in abortions. Number two, it is an affront to human dignity in terms of how it treats the embryos that are frozen and used in a utilitarian fashion, as you say, as human Mm -hmm. stock. And number three, (laughs) it breaks the mold or the model for how God wants children to be produced within the context of the sexual union between man and woman, Mm -hmm. right? Yes. Okay. Now, that's the apologetics. So let's move on to point two, which is the evangelization. Because as I said earlier, I think we can say those three things, but those three things don't necessarily make sense. Maybe number one does, but number two and number three does not make sense to a lot of non-Catholics. It doesn't even make sense to a lot of Catholics, sure. okay? Because, as you said, they're downstream of other teachings. Mm-hmm. They aren't obvious and intuitive. So you have to sort of buy into a Catholic worldview about what the human person is, about matrimony, about sexuality, the nature of human life, the responsibilities we have morally to human life, if you take th- those three points and you, ex- and you take them out of that context, they just sound a little weird and, and- Kind of arbitrary. They sound arbitrary. They sound weird. And that's why even if you go to Protestants, you go to evangelicals, you go to a lot of Catholics. Because here's an example of that. The last point you gave about sexuality to produce children and the unitive and the procreative, that's exactly the reason why the Catholic Church opposes contraception. Yes. Which is incomprehensible to almost all evangelicals. And if we're honest, every survey shows that most Catholics don't even buy it. Yeah, that's true. So something like 80% of Catholics practice contraception. 
So then if you say, well, hey, here's this teaching on IVF, and this is one of the reasons why IVF is bad, and one of the reasons it's bad is the same reason contraception is bad, and they go, but I don't even buy that contraception is bad. Mm -hmm. So, Corey, explain how these are linked to bigger issues within Catholicism, and maybe in a future show or future shows, we can unpack those issues. Like, for example, talk about the theology of the body, talk about the nature of the human person. Let's just do this in a couple of minutes, just, and we'll put pins in those issues and maybe come back and do future shows on them. Yeah, and, and definitely chime in if there's something that I, that I miss or that you want to emphasize, even in summary. But yeah, so theology of the body is a big topic, of course. But um, fund, fundamentally, we start with the idea that, that God made human beings, male and female, in complementarity with each other. And so you, you see that in many ways, but the most obvious one is, is sexually, that you need a man and a woman, and they contribute different things to the production of offspring, that they're not the same, but that they are both, both necessary, and that they both have equal dignity. And because both men and women are made in God's image, we can't treat them as things. We can't treat them as subject to our whims and wills. They belong to God, and, and God loves them, and we need to treat them with dignity and respect. And that's true of children as, as well, that human beings at any stage of development deserve or have the right to dignity and respect. And so that undergirds the fact that we're opposed to their, the killing that is involved in IVF, that we're opposed to sort of the unnatural imprisonment or treat, treating them like, like objects or uh, tools that's involved in the process. I guess I would just, again, there's a lot more that we could go into this, but that the general principle that God has designed humanity and our bodies and our reproductive cycles in a particular way, and that we are not free to redesign them at will, that there is a proper submission of the creature to the creator in this regard, as in many others. And so when we try to take it into our hands and change it however we want to, whether that's IVF or, or something else, there are all kinds, not only is that act itself wrong, it leads to all kinds of unintended and um, negative consequences down the line because it's breaking God's purpose for the human person. Well said. I would maybe just tack on two other little quick yeah, thoughts. Yeah, go for it. When we talk about the nature of the human person, one of the things in that backdrop of Catholicism or premises of Catholicism is that the nature of human beings is a union of both the physical and the spiritual. Sure. Yeah. Right? And so this is why we believe that life begins at the moment of conception rather than at a certain point of development. Mm -hmm. Because we don't believe that human beings are utilitarian. In other words, not functional. Your humanity is not dependent on your functionality. Mm -hmm. So whether it's at the beginning of life, when you're just conceived, or minutes or weeks after your conception, or at the end of your life, when you're you know, lying in the nursing home. Or at any stage along the way, if you have a, a disability that, that keeps you from functioning in a normal way. <laughs> exactly. None of those things impact your humanity because you're a, an embodied soul. And so there is a soul united with the body. And again, we could do a whole episode on this and maybe we should, but that's one of those sort of things that is either upstream or undergirds the... Un the teaching that we're talking about IVF, mm -hmm. and unless you get what the definition of a human being is within, not even, it's not only Catholic moral teaching, it's philosophy. Mm -hmm. It goes back to Thomas Aquinas and what this is the nature of a human being. The other thing I would say is going back to Thomas Aquinas is Catholic teaching on what is good and bad. Catholicism teaches that are objective moral goods and objective moral evils, mm -hmm. and that those are not contingent on intentions or contexts. There are some things that are just always evil. It doesn't, doesn't matter if you do them for a good reason. It doesn't matter if you think you're justified. It doesn't matter what the context is. It's just always wrong. A lot of times, people's intention in IVF is a good thing. Sure. Another way of saying this is in Catholicism, the end doesn't justify the means. Mm -hmm. So if we're going to fight against IVF, we're going to have to from an apologetic standpoint, teach people what 
the church believes, and two, evangelize them so that they understand the total context of Catholicism and embrace that and have well-formed consciences. Yes. Which leads us to the third point, and that is the pastoral care. Mm -hmm. Let's take your typical couple. Bob and Sally uh, have been trying to have children. They've gone through all the normal means, and they've gone to the doctor, and they've done tests, and they've done hormone injections, and they've done this, and they've done that, and their fertility doctor has advised them try this. IVF is usually the last resort because it's extremely complicated and extremely expensive. Right. Okay. So nobody does that as the first route. Nobody says, hey, we'd like to have kids. And instead of trying the old fashioned way, we're just going to do IVF. Right. It's usually the end of the line for people. Like I said, adoption has become very difficult in the United States for a lot of different reasons. And we could probably have a whole episode about that. So here's Bob and Sally, and they're like, you know, we've prayed about this. We're a married couple. We look over and we see Corey and his family, and there's a whole pew full of kids, and we want that too. And doesn't the church want us to have children? Doesn't God want us to have children? We've tried everything. Sally cries herself to sleep every night. Bob feels terrible. Maybe their marriage is on the rocks because, you know, crushed dreams, broken dreams, right? All these kinds of things. And the fertility doctor says, hey, we could try this. Oh, and by the way, it's fifty or $100,000, and they're willing to take out a second mortgage on their house, borrow money, because they want a baby. Now, you can go to Bob and Sally and say, this is an objective grave moral evil, and that is true. And you can say to them, Catholicism teaches that the ends don't justify the means, which is true. But if that's all you're going to say to Bob and Sally, so therefore don't do it, you're going to break their hearts, and they're probably going to go through with it anyway. And my argument there is, how many Catholics contracept anyway? Sure. How Catholics aren't supposed to have premarital sex. How many couples are sleeping together before they get married? You tell them not to, but they're going to, and they're going to use contraception. And and I'm not justifying this, but in the same way, (laughs) if you think you're going to wave Bob and Sally off because you gave them a pamphlet, or a homily, I'll tell you what's going to happen. Bob and Sally are going to make a Faustian bargain. They're going to do it. And a lot of them are going to do it. Now, I'm not talking about, you know, well-formed Catholic consciences. I'm just talking about ordinary Americans. Mm-hmm. Okay? I'm talking about evangelicals, Protestants, secular people. They're going to do it. Bob and Sally are going to do it. And they're not going to be waved off because there are some Catholic people on Twitter, or some Catholic commentators, or a Catholic YouTube that said this is wrong. If the church really wants to deal with this, we're going to have to pastorally engage these people, okay? Because what you're asking them to do is to bear a cross in their life. Let's think about some other examples like that. You've got a young couple that get married, and shortly after getting married, one of them is involved in a terrible car accident or contracts a terrible disease and is going to spend the rest of their life you know, paralyzed or needing care. And the remaining spouse has just been given a sentence that the next 50 years of your life are taking care of this person. Mm-hmm. It's not what you signed up for. Well, it may be, you know, yeah. It was something in sickness right. and in health was theoretical. But it was in the, that was in the small print, right? Yeah. But, you know, this is not what you expected. What you hoped for, certainly. What you hoped yeah. for, and now this is your life. Or you do have a baby, maybe the old-fashioned way, and the child is born with some crippling birth defect. And the rest of your life is now taking care of that child. Or, let's take it into some other areas, you're same-sex attracted. And the church says to you, well, the right thing to do is to live a celibate life. And you're like, that's a hard cross for me to bear. Because I want to have a relationship. I want to be close to somebody. I want to get married. I want to do this. Why can't I, you know? In, In any number of other circumstances I could imagine, sometimes people have very hard crosses to bear in life. And the church, as Catholics and as the church, we have to help them bear those crosses or help them to understand that that bearing that cross is something that they need to do. Because otherwise what's going to happen is that spouse whose spouse is now crippled Mm -hmm. is going to leave them. I'm not saying always, but you know, yeah, that, that's something that could happen. Yeah. Or the couple that has the disabled child, somebody, you know, one of the parents fails 
or that same sex attracted person kind of gives in and ends up getting, you know, into a same sex marriage. If you're not going, and what we're talking about here are people who want a good thing. Mm -hmm. They want to have a baby. So why don't you, I'm I'm doing all the talking here, but Corey, talk about, because here's what I'm thinking is, this is what accompanying ought to mean. Mm -hmm. You want to talk about that? Yeah, no, I I think you're right. And it's something that I know I need to tread lightly and humbly on because yeah, it, it is, these are painful and difficult things. Even for someone who is convinced that they need to bear the cross is not easy and you don't want to treat it it lightly in any way. But I think when we talk about accompaniment in this sense, it's having a relationship with someone and helping them to understand what God's call on their life is and providing whatever assistance you can in, in doing that in avoiding evil and choosing good the you know the metaphor involved in the word accompanying is walking next to somebody and if you're accompanying someone that it's implied that you're sort of the guide or the the helper for them to go in the right direction and so that's i think what authentic accompaniment is helping someone in whatever way you can and that'll look different in any different relationship to to take the right road and to carry the cross that God has given them, not to walk with them. And if you know that they're going in the wrong direction, simply to not say anything or to encourage them in the wrong thing, but to do what you can in a sensitive and in a loving and merciful way to to help them to do what God would have them do. And I tread especially lightly in that because I don't think that I'm any sort of sort of expert or or experienced practitioner in doing that. But I think that's essentially the call for us if we have family or friends or others in our lives who are, you know, they're tempted by IVF or any of these other things to help them understand both the goodness of what they desire, but also what means God has ordained for them that are that would be good and which ones would not be and then if there simply is no other means to pursue the good that they want to have a child is help helping them to bear that cross to accept that privation or, or that lack in their life with grace and with the help of God because it's not they're not going to be able to do it on their own e- either they will simply suffer without meaning and purpose, or they will choose to do the wrong thing in that situation. Even if you could get a major political part of the United States to make IVF illegal tomorrow, people are going to do it because they're going to go to Canada or Mexico (laughs) or the Bahamas to do it. Because couples that are at this level of desperation and wanting to make this level of investment are going to cross a border and do IVF there. So my point is not that we shouldn't try to work to ban it. My point is that if all you're going to do is just pursue this at the political level, you've got to deal with the issue. And then driving the issue is a fertility crisis, people's desire for children, (laughs) misunderstanding or ignorance of the Catholic teaching on this, a sense for some people that, well, you know, that may be well and good. That's what the church teaches, but my, my desire outweighs that. And so the only thing that you're going to be able to do to sort of sufficiently deal with this is to, in addition to whatever political thing you do, is to do the apologetics, the evangelization of the pastoral care so that people will choose not to do it. Mm-hmm. And it, it seems to me that those three things are primarily at the you know, at the micro level, at the level of your own relationships with people. That isn't to say that, of, of course, that apologetics and evangelization can't be done at the macro level, and lots of Catholics are doing that. But the thing that each of us has the most control over and the most agency in is, the, you know, our relationship with that person in our family or our friend or our neighbor who 
we actually have some access to. Yeah, I think that's right. And there are um, almost certainly people around you, couples around you struggling with fertility <laughs> that are looking for options. And they're going to be drawn to whatever they think is going to solve their problem. And so that's why we have to be able to work with them and help them to understand why the church teaches what it teaches and help them to choose, you know, the right thing. Mm -hmm. And and I think there are a lot of parallels with other issues with abortion, certainly in, in the sense that both with abortion, yes, there are things that we can and should do politically, but also abortion won't end unless people are convinced that they should not choose that. And also that if we have loving and Christian relationships with women and with couples who might be in the situation where they would consider abortion, that kind of Christian accompaniment can be a factor in helping them not to make that choice and not to abort a child, but take it further that someone who has already made the decision that we can help them and their Catholic ministries that are helpful for healing if someone is repenting of having made a decision to have an abortion. Or in, in this case, we haven't mentioned this before, but I think it's an important corollary to the teaching about IVF being wrong, is that it doesn't affect the, the fact that a child has been conceived in a way that was evil does not have any effect on the dignity or the goodness of that child. So we still, of course, need to love that child and value that child, and we can still have a loving and helpful Christian and accompanying relationship with with a couple that has made that decision in their past as well. Yeah, this episode is getting super long, but I just want to say one quick thing about uh, the abortion thing. (laughs) I think on the abortion front, the analogy may be weirdly here is to a particular kind of abortion, which are the hard case abortions, which in the case of rape and incest, because that's been talked about forever. It's like, well, what about rape and incest? Because that's a hard teaching. Yeah, especially hard. Right? You're coming to somebody and saying, God calls you to do something hard, right? Very hard. Yeah. God calls you to bear a real cross <laughs> here because your natural instinct would be to abort that child for rape and incest, and almost nobody around you would blame you. But there's a hard teaching here about what the right thing to do is. And I think it's a little like that. I mean, obviously, this, these are people who want to have a healthy baby and want to do, but mm-hmm. there's a hard teaching to say, yeah, but you got to step back from that edge. So I, I would say to all of you who are listening, you know, you do have to wrestle with the politics of this, but you'd have to wrestle with politics of like 50 other moral issues. I mean, you know, our society is grappling with so many moral issues and you have to sort all those out in your Catholic conscience or in your conscience and go into the voting booth and decide what you think is the right decision based on how you weigh all of those things and how you understand them. But, but on this one, I just felt like in the last couple of days, there's been this big thing. Like if we can't, you know, if we can't get a major political party to commit to this, then, you know, the battle is lost. And I just want to say that whether they do or not, you're not going to win this battle until you win it in the hearts and minds of the, the couples who want it. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. Right? Okay. Hey, as always, rate and review the podcast. Send us your <laughs> questions and comments, consideringcatholicism at gmail.com, Twitter, consideringcatholicism.com. And, you know, as always, we would appreciate your support financially to keep this ministry going. You can hit the support links uh, on the website or in the show notes. And we'll be back, no doubt, in the future to talk about some of these other moral issues. So, you know, but uh, yeah, thanks for listening. Yep.